Marco Esposito from COSAN, who is going to tell us about very tiny, beautiful hyperspectral payloads. Right. And then I'm going to yeah. unmute you. Yeah, there we go. Welcome. So thanks. Thanks, Nyasha. So is, is the audio good? Yeah, let me get you a little bit higher. Hold on. I'm going to do something here. There we go. Let's try this. Thanks. So, hi all, I'm uh, Marco Esposito, working for Cosine Measurement System, a Dutch company. We build measurement system for ground, for space, and for space we are um, dealing a lot with spectral imagers. And one of those is uh, called HyperScout, is uh, already in flight now, so I'm going to tell you a little bit the, uh, where it stands, what it's doing, and actually the, what is the final goal that is very interesting for you, uh, and based on the discussion I heard so far. Um, so HyperScout is, to my knowledge, the first ever 1.3 kilograms fully fledged spectral system in space. And uh, uh, a commercial available, by the way, so for whoever wants to deploy it in, uh, within one satellite or a constellation. Uh, the, um, the points of the development was all about, um, uh, let's say, recovering from this limitation of downlink. So hyperspectral, you, know, you all know, uh, it's, it's uh, generating an amount of data that's not uh, manageable by any satellite, I would say. So it's terabytes per orbit. So it's, it's very difficult to, especially for, for nanosatellites, to get this data down. <laughs> and uh, therefore, one of the, the assets of the system, and this is something we are still working on and try to demonstrate uh, already with this flight, is to, to have the ARD data actually in orbit. And actually even a step more. So you can have this level, so you can download already the data ready to be processed or to be analyzed. But actually for some application, we are looking really to do the full chain there. So really download the information and coordinate and play with this. So there are different levels, different uh, accuracy levels. So I'm, I'm sure I will trigger a lot of discussions. You will be skeptical. But I think it's a funny, very funny project and uh, interesting to carry on. And we are doing that. Um, so this is really the, the core. So together with the, our partners, we are not alone. Uh, later, I will show the consortium. So we're trying really to, for what is possible, to replace the large systems on ground and try to do as much as we can in orbit. This is what it means. Means for us during development, making sure that all the algorithms, but also the hardware, they are somehow tailored uh, uh, to each other, and therefore this can work as a chain. And uh, um, this worked so far well, and uh, we are uh, we are now in the middle of. Uh, uh, yeah, I will let you see later where we are. So the HyperScout is a, um, a push broom sensor, 2D uh, push broom sensor. So you get all the spectral sensitivity along track, while across track you have, uh, uh, let's say, the same wavelength. The, um, I will start, as I said, uh, uh, in, this, in the start from the, let's say, level 2A is what we call, I think, the ARD at this point. So for us, the level 2A is the data cube, uh, uh, fully georeferenced, radiometrically corrected, and projected on a user map. Um, this is something that we are um, uh, um, have demonstrated on ground on the same, let's say, hardware. And now in space, not uh, not now, but in a few weeks, we are going to try a few experiments. And that for us is the backbone uh, to enable uh, you uh, um, uh, generating new applications that can be run either directly on board or can be, as I said, you can download, let's say, only the data you need and do it on ground. Um, for our, let's say, showcase, we have, with our scientists, we have selected the file application you see on the top. Uh, let's say uh, the usual suspects, or nothing new. But these were the ones we were, uh, let's say, confident that they're simple, uh, 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 that we could try to do the full chain, so to go to all over, to the end. And uh, um, so vegetation, so typical uh, indices, nothing, nothing new. Crop water requirements means, means crop factor uh, calculated in orbit, so the KC from the FAO uh, organization downloaded directly and then used, of course, in the next uh, uh, processing step. Fire hazard, so making sure that there is a, a risk uh, uh, map for, for, for a fire in, um, let's in the remaining areas. Flooding areas delineation, so really mapping the flooding, uh, how it goes. And, and there are more general change detections, so to detect changes from passes to passes based on spectral response changes or, or pre-shaped uh, uh, geometrical areas on ground. Um, so for this, as I said, the level 2 is the backbone, so we're really trying to focus now to demonstrate that, and this uh, is, is, uh, is taking place. Um, on ground, the performance that we have been experiencing for this processing on our uh, platform are ranging between 40 and 80 seconds. So th this means from level 0 to, to uh, one of those applications that, are, again, are, are simple ones, you can get to this kind of, of performance. For acquiring one um, uh, data cube, let's say a full acquisition, 
um, being a push broom takes about 40 seconds. So this means that in under 20 seconds you should be able to have the information and be able, if you have inside a ground station close by, download this data to the, direct to the user. Then what to do if it is, let's say, uh, um, uh, we like to say this is a kind of warning, early warning system. So if you download this map and you see that there is something interesting happening in your field of view, you can actually then perhaps download only a subset, or only a region of interest of the <laughs> ARD uh, set. So because the vegetation application, of course, will be, uh, or the application will be uh, slightly less accurate if you do it on ground. So the atmospheric correction will not be the same. The, there are many things will be our shortcuts. So there are many things will not be accurate as you do on ground. But it can be a first step to actually download only what you need and not download the full terabytes and having all the problems you have to dealing with all this amount of data. Um, um, so this is something started already a few years ago. It's, a, it's, it's done with the European Space Agency. We have started in 2014. Finally, we launched this February, um, and is in, uh, it's been launched with a, a mission called GOMEX-4. That is a Danish mission. So we are hosted payload, secondary payload. It's only for our demonstration, and um, since 2nd of February is uh, is operational. Uh, the the mission itself is a uh, two satellites. We are on board only one. Of course, there is only one abstract imager, but the mission is also about station keeping and other things that we are not involved in. Uh, how it works now is that we uh, we we call ourselves uh, a user own base. We collect for the operations all the wishes from our partners and also by uh, from the agency, and then we send in orbit our um, uh, commands and our <coughs> mission plans that are executed by our computer. The team is this one, so we are in the lead. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, Del Q Delft and Vito, that are our, our algorithm suppliers for our, uh, for our processing chain. And then we have other companies working more on, uh, on um, implementation parts. And then the other stakeholders, the TISA, the Netherlands Space Office, the Norwegian Space Office, and uh, 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 Belgium, uh, that have contributed with money, of course, to the project. Um, so we have been commissioning the system already in March, where we have been um, working, um, uh, enabling only uh, core subsystems like the, the sensor, the, the, the first FPG, front-end electronics, and, uh, and try to see whether the chain of the core subsystems were, were, were working. And indeed, it was the case. So we had a very limited budget in terms of uh, uh, energy and also data links. We had to really compress these images uh, uh, um, yeah, to 1.5 megabytes, so really, really limited. But this told us that the system was working. Then finally, in July, we uh, were in the position to actually have a full commissioning closed. And this is also, was also successful. So we are able to collect different data sets from different parts of the world and show the full resolution images to ourselves. The, this just to um, um, give you a full impression of the operations, how how went. So I'm not going to be in details, but basically during the first orbit, we had to point where we wanted. During the second orbit, we were able to send all the comments and get the acquisition down. And during the third orbit, we could get part of the data telemetry down. Um, these are the first two commissioning images, as we call them. These are hyperspectral frames. So each of the lines, as I said, is a different spectral wavelength. Uh, the one you see on top is, uh, was taken over Scotland and was only a subset of the, of the imager, so only between about 440 and 580. Uh, so we're missing actually the dead edge. So, so, but that, again, was showing us the, 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 the working system. The one instead at the bottom was over Cuba, and uh, we got here the full set. And um, we are very happy here, uh, even though it was compressed and binned due to the limited budget, we were able to check that radiometry was, or let's say the light we're collecting is enough to, to, to fill our well. And uh, with, with actually short integration time, so we're very happy about that. Um, uh, just again, qualitatively also to check the, the, the spectral response, just in a qualitative way, uh, we checked on a few parts of the, our image, whether the spectrum will make sense. Um, this is to show you uh, instead more, like more from the engineering part, let's say, the stability of our system in temperature. That is on one side very important because we'll deliver to you good data. Uh, so our system is very small. Um, so we have no uh, active thermal controls, all is passive. So for us, this was an important check. What shows is this, uh, this plot is how the temperature of core subsystem are changing along one orbit. And uh, so the most important one to see is the, the, uh, the pink, the, upper, the telescope, actually. And um, what you see, the, the black part is the, uh, the eclipse. 
uh, and this part is where the landmass started and this green is when actually our system was on. And what you see here that the telescope was actually within one degree stable and that tells us that is um, the, the data we get are consistent with each other. Of course, we have characterized the system for different temperatures, even though it will change more, it will not be a problem, but this gives us more, uh, more confidence about the future uh, uh, delivery of the quality. Um, so, as I said, we have done commissioning. Now we are in the middle of calibration. So we are now acquiring all data sets to calibrate with vicarious, uh, so in various sites, um, the um, calibration spectrally, geometrically, uh, and also from the radiometry point of view. So this is now ongoing. Um, and uh, um, let's say these are the data, that the location the regions so far we have been able to collect data from. So as I said, now we are here collecting data over deserts basically to, to do calibrations. Um, and um, this is the ones we plan in the next months, at least we have already, uh, let's say a mission plan to validate also the applications, uh, the, the ones that I showed in the start. Um, so, as I said, ongoing, we are, yeah, yeah, we are doing calibration, I will not be repeating. Um, I'm sure now something, but it's really preliminary, so actually data we got two days ago, and um, um, so I've been not really checked, but just to show you a little bit the confidence that uh, we see features that other systems see, uh, but you know, don't look too careful, let's say. it's just to show uh, first impression, first insight. Um, uh, we compare the system with the uh, Hyperion data that actually are from the past, um, but again, over desert, so to see whether our system is something wrong. Uh, uh, and still this quality check is ongoing. So this is also, uh, let's say, funny for me to see the difference of so very big instrument uh, and uh, Hyperscat actually delivering, uh, not the same, but let's say comparable data. Um, these are the SWOTs, if you see, um, uh, to show difference. So these trips are um, Hyperion one, so very, very narrow, about, I think, uh, seven kilometers by 20 while Hyperscout is pretty large. So we are talking of, let's say, if you use a full system, will be 300 kilometers uh, plus uh, by 150. Um, actually, this is the full comparison. So the most important numbers, um, perhaps indeed, is resolution. So I'm sure you will not like it, but for my perspective, this is pretty cool because, yeah, in a, such a small system. Um, so we took 70 meters for our system while the data from uh, the Hyperion was 30. Uh, as I said, we offer 350 kilometers in, in, let's say, if you use the full SWOT, in this configuration we have to use a subset, so 220 kilometers, uh, while the strip of Hyperion is 20 by 7.5. And then the other important part, of course, is the um, spectral part. So the one is flying now is uh, visible in the inference, so 401,000, with uh, about 45 bands of 40 nanometers uh, resolution. But we have, let's say, another version that is, we call it high resolution, where the, the range is a bit narrower, but you get much more bands and a better resolution, under 50 and with 500 meter resolution. But this is not yet in flight. Um, while Hyperion, we, uh, we know, so is up to short wave, so up to 2500 with 120 bands and 10 nanometers resolution. Then the rest, let's say, the single to noise, um, uh, I, I got different numbers from papers, so I'm not sure Hyperion, which is the actual number, but depends, of course, on the radiance. Uh, about 100 plus, I will say, and for us is always between 50 and 100. Uh, but a uh, very nice one is 1.3 kilograms again against the 49, and of course few liters again, uh, uh, and um, 10 watts and 78, 78 watts. So these are um, the um, images we got, as I said, two days ago. So this is the, over the Algeria in, in Africa. Again, this is uh, on the frames with all the bands that you see on the left. On the right, you see the Ipedian one. Uh, again, from Algeria, but somewhere in the past, to be honest, now I don't know when it was. So also time is completely uh, different for sure. Um, but this is to show, yeah, that we are looking at deserts. Uh, that is what we see now. So you see the one you see on top is from Hyperscout. You see on the bottom is the different spectra from uh, yeah, three runs of Hyperion over Algeria, uh, Algeria 3 and 5, and also over Libya 4, just to get a bit more data. So we see also a bit of variability among the Hyperion data themselves. Uh, but we see the same features. Of course, these are data, raw data for us, are so not corrected. There is no uh, atmospheric correction, BRDF correction, there's nothing. It's just to see the features are there and something's, uh, 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 nothing seems wrong, let's say. No, of course, they have, you have to go through the full processing and check it out uh, properly. Um, what is happening for the, uh, the future? So we already got an activity started, uh, so uh, contract placed to cross calibrate with Sentinel-2. Um, so by using machine learning, so how to actually uh, um, 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 leverage 
the higher resolution of Sentinel and the, the basically the, the higher spectral um, content of hyperscale and match them together from a calibration point of view. And then also uh, later, this is an activity we'll start this year, how to actually improve the hyperscale resolution, especially by blending with the, with the Sentinel-2 data. Uh, of course, we mm, look at Sentinel because it's uh, at the moment one available and uh, uh, yeah, made by the agency, so it's paid by them. So we're going to leverage uh, as much as we can, but we look also at the satellite Sentinels and, uh, and, uh, and more. Um, then, from the operation, operations point of view, we are going to continue with more the application uh, validation. And we are going to have, as I said, all the sites that you saw before um, uh, imaged. And we are going to have also an airborne campaign to cross-correlate the, the measurements. Uh, uh, plus, then, the most interesting part is we are going to run onboard processing. So once all this is done, we will be able then to start with the onboard processing experiments to see how far in the chain we can get with reasonable data uh, output. Um, the final dream, I'm not sure we'll make it during this demonstration, but is really to run one orbit, one revolution, and to be able to process different applications delivered to users right away. And so the one that you see here in the list is actually where we have partners running experiments on ground so we can then cross-check the results. So it goes, uh, uh, let's say, from fire hazard, floods, uh, change detection, uh, draft, and, uh, and so on, but all in one revolution. That will be the final um, goal. Um, again, the future are not too far, so we are already working on a second uh, flight. Uh, we are going to deliver in December. So we add to this, is, this system also uh, four thermal bands, uh, so spanning from uh, 8.2 to 12.5. And uh, this is going to um, fly again with a two satellites uh, mission uh, that is looking more at solid moisture. And um, so there is also a radiometer on board. Our system is going to improve the resolution of the radiometer. Uh, so in the end, we'll be delivering high resolution <laughs> solid moisture maps. But for us, it's really getting another step into the spectral bands. And then we will have two systems in flight, one with the thermal channel, both with onboard software capabilities, uplink as well of new software. The idea is then is really to uh, start cooperations with uh, any interested party that has cool ideas in mind and uh, code new software, send it up, check results, download the data, so do experiments and the pilot projects in order to, to validate, let's say, this idea of reducing the data at the source instead of uh, dealing with all this data on the ground. Of course, it always starts so full of problems, issues, uh, and challenges. Uh, more in the future, we're working also on other spectral channels. So this is it's become really a very nice platform to experiment new channels and, and, and therefore also new applications. Here we entered also a bit in the UV. Uh, where we are working already on to see uh, uh, atmospheric content, uh, chemistry and application like that. There is a website you can go and the, we can, you can talk to me, but if you're interested and uh, we don't manage to talk today, we can uh, definitely uh, talk over uh, uh, email or you can apply here, or you can spread this message. We are open to corporations. And that's it. Short enough. Any questions? Yes, very short. Nice. <laughs> yes. Um, does the 10 watt power budget include onboard processing? Ten. Do you do the onboard processing and the power budget? Yeah, 10 watts is average. Uh, then you get a peak, I think, of 15 <coughs> if you do acquisition and processing in parallel. So 10 watts is kind of an average if you do or processing or acquisition. That we can do in parallel, but um, at the moment we don't prefer to. We try to, you know go step by step. And the a benefit, again, of doing it on the, the payload is just reduction amount of data you have to download? That's what the, the, the first, let's say, benefit. And the second, if we get to decent results, we like really to use as an early warning system. You can really deliver the information as a, as a service. Yeah, this is the, the amazing thing is you can imagine getting this data down straight to the ground station yeah. with no further processing rate. It's an ARD straight out of the ground station, which means you could have ground stations and pickup trucks yeah. in an ideal world, right? In, right around UHF the place. is enough then. And yeah. you will get on an iPad literally with the data ready to use. Pretty cool. Right here. Yes. Uh, is the bigger constraint the power, like the computing that you're trying to do on board, or your actual downlink? Um, like the bandwidth that you can actually get down to the ground? Uh, let, let's see, the first that we are trying to overcome is the bandwidth. So with this S-band, usually, uh, I know people have better systems, uh, but uh, in nanosats usually you have one megabit, two megabits, three megabits, 
and for this data, yeah, it's nothing. So we you have one gigabyte per per actually per scene. And uh, so this is the first thing we are trying to overcome. And then, of course, we enter into how do we process the data without energy? And then this optimization that we are going through. Uh, it, indeed, also the energy is very uh, limited also from the processing. But we, we found a way to, yeah, to do something there. More questions? So what's the, I guess, for this mission, what's the duty cycle that this Baylor on the side like can operate. Can it can it image out of Eclipse at all times, um, or it will the, the hard drive will fill up or something? No, the hard drive is not a problem. It's the energy. Uh, so it's power. The power. It's, it's the power. Budget. Yeah. From our point of view, we're full of uh, memory. Uh, we can keep going for long, but yeah, the the, the energy I think uh, it's it's limiting to 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's the geometrical reference that is used on orbit? You mean for uh, for, uh, for uh, the calibration, geometrical calibration? Or? Yeah, or I'm assuming there is lens geometrical calibration and there's some sort of orthoing on orbit? We do, so we have a DTM in orbit already, so we can do projection uh, okay. on a digital elevation model, and uh, we are now running calibration on geometrical sites, so we okay. and then we create our connection, lookup people for the connection in orbit. Cool, beautiful. Any other questions? We would like to. <laughs> Planet again. <laughs> Did you hear? Can you repeat? The design, the design part. The, yeah, that is done. But uh, well, yeah, it was it was okay. It was uh, yeah, we're, but it's okay. Is that your question? How much cost? We think it's feasible. So we the exercise was to um, to. Uh, look at low cost as low cost as possible. Of course, it's always debatable what is low cost, but we made such it is reliable, so it's actually a high quality. We'll say that will stay in space for long, and uh, same time it's affordable if you want to launch a mega constellation. But it's all relative. Yeah. So uh, you're using a push broom, right? So what is the comparable uh, variation for calibrating a sort of lens uh, two-dimensional hyper you know, two-dimensional space? What is the reference? What do you yeah, mean? Just the signal to noise approximate comparison to a direct imager. So we are talking here of, let's say, uh, uh, in average 70, 80 SNR, uh, uh, peaks are also higher. And so we saw the Hyperion is actually was similar. Um, I think a Sentinel-2 is <coughs> better in some places, Sorry. lower in some other places. So I think is in the average, I would say, of, of spectral imagers. Uh, Hyperspectral, there are no many references. Uh, I think there are in flights now us and subtle logic, but subtle logic, yeah, we, we have discussed, so it would be nice actually to check what are the no, references. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome.